Welcome back to the Free Mind Podcast, where we explore topics in Western history, politics, philosophy, literature, and current events with a laser focus on seeking the truth and an adventurous disregard for ideological and academic fashions. I'm Matt Burgess, an assistant professor of environmental studies and faculty fellow of the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado Boulder. My guest today is Lionel Shriver, an author and journalist whose many books include We Need to Talk About Kevin, and most recently, Abominations, Selected Essays from a Career of Courting Self-Destruction. Our conversation focuses on one of the fascinating contradictions of Miss Shriver's life that she has written about. On the one hand, she has recently become an advocate for natalism, the idea that birth rates have become concerningly low for society, especially in developed countries like ours. On the other hand, she personally chose not to have children, and she has stated publicly that she does not regret that decision. We discuss what natalism is, possible reasons for declining birth rates in the U.S. and other Western countries, and what, if anything, can or should be done to raise birth rates. Lionel Shriver, welcome to the Free Mind Podcast. Oh, it's nice to talk to you again. Yeah, you too. So today's topic is natalism and fertility, and I think it would be helpful to just have a little bit of background. So I'm an environmental scientist, and in environmental sciences, overpopulation used to be a major concern. So in 1960, the U.S. fertility rate was almost four children per woman, and it was above seven in several other countries. There was this really famous book called The Population Bomb that had forecasts like the UK might collapse by 2000, and so would India due to population-driven starvation. And in response to that, there were countries that enacted some very coercive anti-fertility policies, most famously perhaps the one-child policy in China, which some estimates have as causing 100 million coerced abortions disproportionately of girls. But now people are starting to talk about the opposite issue. So there was a book that came out recently called Empty Planet. The UN population forecast has been revised down. So at one point, you know, not that long ago, it was 11 to, 12, 11 to 12 billion by 2100. Now it's about 10 and a half. There's some demographers that think it should be revised down even more to eight and a half to nine billion by 2100 with actually population globally peaking in the middle of this coming century. And within individual countries, there's some even starker realities. So both international and Chinese demographers now project that China is on track to lose about half of its current population by 2100. And the declines in fertility that we're seeing across the world are driven by choices. So access to contraception makes a small difference, but not much. The main drivers seem to be urbanization and female education. And the seems to be ubiquitous across the world, happening in all regions. So for example, birth rates are still high in some sub-Saharan African countries, but the region is not a major outlier in the relationship globally between per capita income and birth rates. And in fact, there are some relatively affluent sub-Saharan African countries like Botswana that have birth rates very close to replacement as of 2021. In fact, among rich countries, there are only two countries that have birth rates above replacement, and those are Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And no country whose birth rates have fallen below replacement have ever come back up above replacement since then. What's different about Saudi Arabia and Kuwait? Religion is an obvious answer, and indeed, religion does seem to provide somewhat of a buffering force on birth rates, but not that big compared to the downward pressure from education. So for example, there are some religious communities in the United States that have above replacement birth rates, but interestingly, the fraction of Americans that are religious is still declining because people are converting away from religion faster. Similarly, there are some immigrant communities that have higher birth rates than native-born in the first generation but their kids and kids' kids tend to have similar birth rates to native-born kids. And in fact, even among immigrants, the birth rate in the U.S. is now below replacement. And so all of these trends have people like Elon Musk suddenly talking about babies. And there's this word that's floating around called natalism, which Merriam-Webster defines as an attitude or policy favoring or encouraging population growth. And so this is what I wanted to talk to you about, because you wrote an article in The Spectator this past July whose title was The Age of the Antinatalists. So my first question is, who are the antinatalists in your view? And what is it about their ideas or ideology that you disagree with? Okay, we're going to come back to that question. But in your summary of reality right now, I would differ on one point. I've read a couple of demographic tomes this last year. And uh, 
one of them was completely devoted to African demography. And I do think that Africa is an outlier. And I think this is going to be a big issue with immigration, with migration, and it's going to be very political. And because race is involved, it's also going to be extremely touchy. But the it does look as if by 2100, there will be at least 4 billion Africans. And that's on a continent that has very poor water resources, which is the biggest constraint on human population anywhere. And it also has poor governance. And you can talk about, oh, everyone will get rich and then stop having babies. But so far, in a lot of countries, even when they improve their economic prospects, the fertility rate is not coming down. So that's the one spanner in your summary. I do not think that we're talking about a universal, worldwide, species-wide plummeting of fertility below replacement rate. But let's return to your question. You're right. I did a column that laid out a a number of, uh, in some ways, unrelated obsessions, especially on the left, which when you put the package together is ultimately anti-natalist. The um, weird obsession with transgenderism, the overall, which of course often results in a lot of these people, if they do get surgery and go through um, cross-sex hormones, will not be able to have children. More broadly, the whole gender spectrum, the LBGTQIA plus alphabet thing, most of the behaviors of those letters do not naturally result in producing more human beings. And, uh, you know, although I clarify I'm pro-choice, uh, the anti-abortion thing and the, how the left is, has got so riled up in the U.S. about the reversal of Roe v. Wade. And uh, in that process, ever since that Supreme Court decision, you've seen a lot of Democrats not simply arguing for abortion access, but advocating abortion, celebrating it, saying how wonderful it was. You know, it's trying to completely reverse the previous stigma. And I won't go on, but there is a, there's an overall package. And you, of course, you add in the climate change obsession and how this is driving so many people of uh, childbearing age to decide we can't bring kids into this world. The future looks bleak. Of course, this the apocalypticism of the left in general, and by the way, that's a, a tendency I think that I probably share, is not oriented toward having a future and therefore is not oriented toward having kids. And of course, on the right, the right has always been more traditionally the, uh, the side of the family. So let, let's dig in a couple of these points because there's, uh, I, I also, if we have time, would love to come back to the, the point about Sub-Saharan Africa because I think there's I think there's some nuances. I think there's some nuances. I, I, I don't. I don't completely, completely agree with your characterization of it. But I also think that probably ninety percent of what we're talking about is kind of different spins on the same set of facts. Basically, we there are a number of countries that are very poor and have high birth rates. And so the question is, what's going to happen? Well, first of all, will they become richer? Right is one question. And secondly, if they do, what what will happen? And nobody can really know that for sure. And I think that you're you're right that there are different points of perspectives out there on, on what those possibilities well, are. Well, but, Africa is the only place in the world that the UN has had to revise its estimates upward. African countries are not following the plan. It is uh, definitely an aberration. That uh, it is, although some of that is is economic. So one of the things that, that actually I, I study in my research group is everybody is overly optimistic in their economic forecasts, especially in poor countries. And so if you think that, that there's a, you know, a strong relationship between affluence and declining birth rates, one reason why I, I suspect that it has sometimes been the case that fertility rate projections have been off in poor countries is not so much that they've been the pathway between affluence and fertility has been off, but the, the affluence part has been, has been off. But if you don't mind, I'd love to dig in on a couple of things you said about, about the U.S., so you mentioned the trend of LGBT identification, and uh, there's a statistic that you cite, and there's, there's been others that have cited similar statistics that something like one in five members of Gen Z identify as LGBT. And in the context of fertility, I want to ask you the following question, and that is, 
I wonder to what extent that statistic in this particular discussion is a red herring. And I ask that for two reasons. The first is that if that was what was driving declining fertility rates in the US, you would expect to see higher fertility rates in countries like Japan, where there's much lower LGBT identification. And yet- I'm going to stop you right there. Sure. Because I want to clarify what I mean. I'm talking about a constellation of positions and obsessions, which if you put them together, suggests an antinatalist predisposition. But that's not to make any causal connection between that predisposition and the fact that people are having fewer children. And I totally agree with you. I do not think that LGBT whatever identification is a major driver of the reduced fertility in the United States or anywhere else. So I'm not sure I want to go there. Yeah, sure. No, no thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. The other thing that I was going to mention, which may, maybe not relevant as a, as a counterpoint, given what you just said, but, but you might find interesting, is I was reading recently that although it's true that a very large fraction of Gen Z now identifies as LGBT, a very mm-hmm. large fraction of that subset of Gen Z that identifies that way are natal females who, when you ask them about their sexual behavior, only report heterosexual behavior. Yes, you've um, been reading Eric Kaufman. That probably is where he read that, yeah. He did a very detailed study, and I thought it was hilarious because a lot of the people who are claiming to have, if you will, wayward sexual proclivities have no such thing. Although I think there is reason to be a little concerned, if only for their happiness, that a lot of these people just aren't having sex, period. That's right. Yeah, sex in general is on decline among young people. Now, so is teenage pregnancy. So some people would say that there's uh, and in fact, I believe so is alcohol and drug consumption. So there's, I've read some interesting takes come down morally on both sides of that observation. So I want to follow up kind of in the same way that I did about the, the LGBT statistic about what you said about climate. And so pushing back against some of the uh, extreme apocalyptic narratives, it's actually something that I've done both in my research and some of my writing uh, about climate change and the macroeconomics of climate change. And so I've certainly come across the statistic that, you know, there's one survey that found 40% of young people say that they're afraid to have children because of climate change. And 45% of them reported anxiety about climate change impacting their daily lives and functioning. That concerns me. I'm not sure I actually buy that. Uh, Explain. I think it's a good, a seemingly lofty reason not to have children, but I'm not convinced that that's really the reason why these people say they, they don't want to have kids, nor do I entirely buy that that is what is going to govern their decisions. Yes, yeah, so you anticipated my question, which is great. So what I was going to ask you was, in the same way that I effectively asked you if you thought that the LGBT identification was driving the bus on fertility rates, and it sounds like you think it's not, I was going to ask you if you thought the same was true about this, this climate anxiety, and it sounds like, again, you think it's not? No, I don't. I don't buy it. It's a lot of trouble to have children. It's very expensive to have children if you're not in an agrarian economy where the kid by the age of seven is going to be pulling the plow. And it's also, we really haven't quite worked out how to have families and and also have two parents who are employed or even have, you know, high flying careers. So, you know, one of the reasons I didn't have children is I cared more about writing books. It was my perceived self-interest. And I just, all that trouble and boredom, it does come with a lot of boredom if you spend much Mm -hmm. time with a two-year-old. You know, I just wasn't up for it. What's changed for me, I don't think that I would describe myself as having formerly been proud of having chosen not to have children. That's going way too far. But I certainly wasn't apologetic about it. While I would say that on my own account, I still think I made the right decision for myself to forego having children, I have become more mournful on behalf of the, the species and my people, however I might define that term. But I think that it was biologically unfortunate that I didn't reproduce. And I am alarmed by the high proportion of people coming up behind me who have also chosen not to have children. And so I find myself in a very dissonant political position. When I talk to younger people of childbearing age, 
I find myself encouraging them to have children, which I think, I mean, considering that the book that I made my reputation on was used mm-hmm. by many people, I was told, as the reason they decided not to have kids, or at right. least a justification for uh, that decision. I think it's comical for me to end up being a politically pro-natalist. But that is weirdly where I land, at least for Western countries and also Eastern countries that are suffering, you know, either decline or are looking at population decline shortly, like um, South Korea or, um, or Japan, very rich cultures that I don't want to see diminished or I don't want to see suffer economically. So it's, I make the weirdest possible advocate of this position. Which is great on a podcast because I, I find it totally fascinating. So if you'll permit me, I'd love to dig in on a, a, a couple of the specific points of this race. And so the first is I want to parse the distinction between individuals, you know, being mournful for individuals and being mournful for society. So the first question I'll ask, and obviously I'm effectively asking you to speculate, you can, can't possibly know this for sure. But you said that in your case, you do not regret your decision to not have children. Now that you see that there's a a large cohort of young women and men behind you that are making that same decision, do you expect that the bulk of them will, like you, on balance, think that it was a good decision? Or do you think that a growing fraction of them might regret their decision? Oh, that's impossible to forecast, honestly. Um, Sure. Let me ask a follow-up question that might tease it out a little bit. It is impossible to forecast. I guess one reason I ask is that it implicit, I think, in some of the trends that you describe in your article, and correct me if this is inaccurate characterization, but it sounds like maybe you're wondering if there are cultural pressures on young people to adopt various attitudes today that are anti-natalist in ways where maybe they don't realize the full extent of that choice or the kind of indirect effects of their choice on their fertility. And so insofar as there's, there's a culturally coercive element to it, you might imagine some regret coming later down the road. Yes. I think that because of these weird, insidious pressures that all drift in the same don't-have-children direction, people are in danger of not taking the decision seriously enough. I don't think you're ever going to get anywhere by arguing that you have to have children for the good of society. You're never going to get anywhere arguing, oh, you have to have babies because we need to maintain Western civilization. You know, this is not, these are not the reasons that people have children in the same way that they don't think that people don't have children because of climate change. You have children for very personal reasons. I don't regret not having kids, but I have only an increased appreciation for the kind of rewards that childbearing has. I mean, I did another uh, article a while ago talking about happiness and that my understanding of happiness is not a state, but a trajectory. And what that means is the things that have ended up making me happiest, that is most satisfied, most gratified, are long projects that were very hard and sometimes had moments of active unpleasantness. Good example is doing a couple of really long cross country bike trips, which involved enormous amounts of misery. You know, you go months on the road and maybe you'll get a tailwind for two days. It's awful. But somehow in the process, you're left with a sense of achievement and that something happened and you completed something that has some meaning. And of course, writing a book is similar. You know, you go through periods where what you're writing is awful. And it's not necessarily always entertaining, but parenthood is just like that, right? It's another long project that has periods of unpleasantness and is really hard and sometimes goes wrong, but there aren't that many things in life that are genuinely satisfying and that give you a sense of meaning, purpose, that make you feel loved, that make you feel that you have achieved something. And parenthood is definitely one of those things. Now, there are no guarantees. And that's why, I I mean, however weirdly, I've come to really admire parents because it's a big risk 
And there's a uh-huh. line in, in um, we need to talk about Kevin, something along the lines of having sex without contraception is like leaving the back door unlocked. You don't know who's going to walk in. And I admire risk taking. We don't talk up risk taking much lately. And I think we should. You never, you know, getting out of bed is a risk. We should be big on risk. And, you know, if my parents didn't take the risk with me, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. You know, and we all have to bear that in mind, that sense of gratitude that that someone made the decision to have you or yeah. at least made the decision not to get rid of you. And if you feel that you, you are yourself a worthwhile entity, then then that was a good decision. That was and therefore I don't think that you owe the world or your parents or anything. I don't think you are obliged to return the favor and have children. I won't go that far. But you'll never know what you're missing if you don't have kids. And I don't either. I can just look around me. And, you know, my younger brother has four children. I sometimes joke that he, he had mine. And I I follow the story very closely. I'm, I'm very sure. interested in how interested I am. I spend a lot of time on the phone with my brother talking about his kids. And I'm never bored, right? Right. And I I'll, I don't see them very often. They hardly know me, really, because I just don't show up very often. But they have no idea how up to speed I am. Because that's it's the remaining narrative in our family. We, we both lost uh, our parents last year. And we used to talk about them all the time. And now, we, you know, that story's over. Another discussion in We Need to Talk About Kevin, which is very much about the whole question of should you have kids, the wife, when she's starting to to warm to the idea, talks about wanting more story. And I think that's one of the best reasons to have kids. More happens. There's more suspense in your life. There's more change in your life. I mean, the main thing that's happened to me, aside from the story of my career, is I've got old. And that's a depressing story. And children coming up, things happen to them. They fall in love. They they have their heart broken. They get together with somebody. They make their own decisions about their own careers. They have their their disappointments. It's like getting to live your life more than once. Yeah, that's a really interesting way to put it. And actually, I do have kids. I have two sons. And uh, they're by far the best decisions that I ever made. For many of the reasons, I think that you describe, although it's also a visceral, primal thing that Mm -hmm. is hard to fully imagine before it's real. You you can't. And I don't have any access to it. So I do. (laughs) My parents, I have to go back. But I, I can't fully inhabit my parents in relation to me. And I, you know, I find that in fiction, I end up having to fake that experience. But right. that's not the same thing as having it or having real access to what it feels like. Yeah. And it's really hard to, I mean, as you said, you know, your your parents, in my case, my parents would occasionally, when I was growing up, try to describe that feeling. But even that doesn't completely prepare you for, for what it's like to mm-hmm. live it. One question I want to ask you, actually, a couple, a couple of questions I want to ask you following up on, on something you said earlier. The first is one of the cultural discussions that I've seen recently that I don't think your piece on natalism directly addressed, but maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, was indirectly connected, is a discussion occurring, what I would say, within the feminist movement, where basically some people who call themselves feminists are saying that feminists fought to gain women access to roles in society that had previously been only available to men, which we would all agree is a I- important thing. And then some say, but but in doing so, is it possible that we might have implicitly then valorized and elevated what were historically masculine social roles and values? So for example, careerism above all else, and then implicitly devalued historically feminine social roles and values related to family. Do you think there's any truth to that? If so, do you think there's any relationship between that and and what we've been discussing, or or do you see them as, as separate, maybe kind of in the way that the LGBT pattern is separate? 
I think there's something to that. I don't think that the women's movement ever completely succeeded or even tried very hard to elevate childbearing and child caretaking to having real social status. We pay lip service to the importance of motherhood, but I don't think that the culture as a whole places an enormous value on it. And therefore, if I imagine myself as having had children, and this is I dealt with when I was making the decision, I see myself as less successful, less productive, less important. You mean by virtue of your decision? Yes, then I would end up having to spend all this time raising kids. And even if it was only two, you know how much effort two children is. And that may be a fear that is might have proven unfounded. For all I know, had I had a couple of kids, I'd have more material for my fiction. Right. And I'd be even more famous. <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Who knows? I love parallel universes. So yeah, I find that I find that almost equally credible. But I do think that feminism has has not been especially pronatalist historically and still isn't. When I was young, the decision not to have children was an expression of self-respect. You know, I take myself seriously. Right. I want to have a career. I have ambition. And I am, my ambition is bigger than being merely a mother. Right. And I am going to forego that, which I wasn't that attracted to begin with, because I want to be a force to be reckoned with. And that hasn't really changed. So it seems like it seems like there's two ways that I've come across that people talk about, you know, how how this might change, you know, without undoing any of the progress that we've made. And the first is the following. So I, I don't know if you're familiar with Anne Marie Slaughter or Sheryl Sandberg, but what they the two of them have in common, they're both very famous, extremely successful women who had children and who wrote books and, and articles and spoke about what that was like. And one of the things that they both remarked on was that they each had what they referred to as a lead parent spouse. And basically meaning uh, they, they, they both have, have husbands who to varying degrees are or were, Cheryl's husband, uh, Cheryl Sandberg's husband unfortunately is deceased, are or were less ambitious than they were and took more of a leading role with the, with the children. And I've talked to a couple of very successful men about that narrative and the the reaction is always no duh that's also the secret of of powerful men that have children and so one one option one way i could see the you know modern social norms becoming more natalist is for it to become more normalized for powerful women to choose more less ambitious more family oriented husbands and there's Really yeah, as much progress on that as there has been in in the workplace, as far as I, as far as I know. That, for example, the there's been lots of articles written about how the big gender imbalance in college right now, where it's you know almost two to one women to men in American colleges, is driving many educated women to not get married as much as it's driving them to you know to marry men who are not college educated. I, so, what do you think about that? I guess. Well, you know, traditionally. Women are drawn to successful men and ambitious men, men who will make money, who will, if anything, raise their status. I don't know how you reverse that. It's one thing to be wishful about how we might be different. Right. But that's a pretty primitive natural biological drive that's difficult to bend in a different direction. So that's a good segue, actually, to the second solution or argument that I've heard regarding the, the fertility rates um, while maintaining the progress that we've made in, in terms of gender equality. And that is basically around policies like paid family leave or mandatory options for part-time, which I believe they have in the Netherlands. And, and I believe that, I can't, I'm not sure if these are exactly the right statistics, but uh, Christina Hoff Summers wrote about this. And I think it was something like more than half of women when that option became available took it. and not zero, but but a much smaller fraction of, of men did. And so if you look at fertility rates, 
there's lots of countries that have policies like that, although obviously to varying degrees and, and people who advance this argument would say not far enough, but none have gone far enough, you know, to get birth rates back up to replacement. So do you think that there, what, what do you think about the argument that we just need to take those kinds of, you know, pro family career policies like paid family leave, you know, mandatory uh, allowing part time and just just ramp them up until the birth rates go back up? It probably won't work. Why not? Well, I mean, if you look at the countries that have these wonderful policies, they don't have above replacement rate fertility, do they? No, that, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> right. So that, <laughs> that would be that would be the argument. I guess I'm asking is, do you think that 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 implies that they just haven't gone far enough, or do you think there's 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 something you know would have to go absurdly far to to work? It doesn't work historically. Pronatalist policies enacted by government do not successfully affect the birth rate. Nowhere. It never works. You can't pay people to have children. And no matter how more graceful you make it with the part time and the child care, you can't make them want to have children. Right. And there's something going on here culturally, biologically, psychologically, that is complicated, but at the same time seems to be happening everywhere. And except Africa. Debatably. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, I'll send you I'll send you the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We can, we can talk offline. I think where 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 I would leave it with with sub-Saharan Africa is is certainly in virtually all sub-Saharan African countries birth rates are above replacement. There's some of the richer ones again like Botswana where it that's come down a lot and it's very close to replacement. They're the but exception. Any 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 argument any prediction, I think, would be just that, right? So, it's uh, I think it's good good to know that there are just different different perspectives out there. But, but you know, in, in the big picture, African cultures, by and large, place enormous value on children and regard a man's worth, for example, in terms of how many children he has. Women too. I mean, it's it's both sexes. It is seen really as the meaning of life. Western culture, if we're going to keep it just the West, doesn't think that anymore. Period. Yeah. Uh, so two follow-up points. One is what you're the the way you described uh, sub-Saharan African cultures certainly applies in a broader way to religious cultures. So, for example, there's a, a well-known review study of the relationship between religion and fertility patterns that concludes that the role of religion depends on three conditions being satisfied. First, the religion articulates behavioral norms with a bearing on fertility behavior, which is, I think, speaks to your point about treating people's worth as related to the number of children they have. Second, the religion holds the means to communicate these values and promote compliance. And third, religion forms a central component of the social identity of its followers. If I think about religious communities within the United States who with internally have higher than replacement birth rates, it seems like they don't have, they have the first and the third of those properties, but not the second one, right? So the, the religion holds the means to communicate the values and promote compliance to some extent, but obviously, you know, for the better, I think we live in a free society. And one of the consequences of that seems to be historically that people are choosing to leave religion fast enough to more than compensate for the fertility rate difference, which I guess brings me back to something that you said at the beginning, which was that you've, the fertility statistics in some ways have made you, and correct me if this is wrong, but I think the word you used was mournful for the, you know, decline of populations of, you know, Western, but also Eastern and, you know, basically generally rich, rich countries. And then yet a lot of our conversation is about, I think, again, correct me if I'm wrong, aspects of our culture that you don't necessarily agree with that have led to these declines in fertility. And so I guess my question is, what are the aspects then that you're mournful about? And to what extent do you think those aspects are or not directly related to the, the fertility statistics? I'm not sure mournfulness is the right word for concern for the economic future, but the economics of this are important. We were inevitably going to go through a very awkward age structure, a very disadvantageous age structure on the way to even just a, a completely stable population. Lots of old people, very few young people. Therefore, you have this wonky uh, support ratio, which is really hard on young people because they're the ones who are working. They get taxed up the wazoo to support right. people like me. And um, their housing value grows slower or shrinks in some cases. I believe that it's the case that house prices are declining in many parts of Japan. 
currently due, due to the population depopulation. Yeah, and that is worrisome. It doesn't send me into mourning, but it does concern me. And I'm going to be part of the generation that most burdens the world because I'm a, a latter boomer. Everyone's going to have good reason to hate me and everyone like me. And it puts a big burden on the healthcare system. And if you have a national healthcare system like the NHS in Britain, it already can't cope and it's just going to get worse. So birth rates are below replacement, quite far below replacement in some countries. There's never been a country that's brought it back up. I promised to ask you this at the beginning. You know, I know, I know what your answer is, but, but just, just to get out of the way, do you support coercive government actions to address this? No, I do not. Neither do uh, I. Let's get that on the record. I absolutely yeah. do not. Both because I believe in one of the a fundamental human rights is to control your own reproduction. I also think that these policies are doomed to failure. So it, it kind of loses on both levels. And you mentioned and, earlier that you're pro-choice. And are you also pro-access to contraception? Of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just you know, getting all those things out of the way. So then my last question is, what if anything can be done about this or should be done about this pattern? And how do you, if at all, do you see it resolving itself? And the, the letter of question is basically the idea that, you know, mathematically, it seems unlikely that we're going to, you know, decline to zero, right? In countries with, with low birth rates, which means that birth rates are going to come up eventually. And so, so how, how do you see that happening? You're right. I am not actively concerned that the human race is about to disappear. It may be changing in its composition. That isn't necessarily some big tragedy. As a species, we've never been in this position before where we have so many parts of the world not replacing itself quite, but it takes a long time. I was amused to read uh, South Korea has apparently on some pronatalist campaign with its people doomed to failure and has calculated that in something like the year 2,753 or, you know, there will be no more South Koreans. Well, that's a long time from now. And I always take projections 750 years out with a grain of salt. As you should. <laughs> yeah. So, and you can certainly make a case that for our species to have voluntarily pulled back its fertility is a good thing because it was going through the roof. I think it's a mistake to imagine that so-called overpopulation is no longer a concern. Because of demographic momentum in Africa in particular, we're still looking at a huge number of people on this planet, which last I read exceeded the point at which we're going to peak, exceeds our need for fresh water, the limits of our fresh water. And that's even if, which a book I read a few years ago, put at about nine and a half billion people. And that's even assuming that all freshwater sources are evenly divided around the world and they are not. Okay. So I don't, I don't think that too many people is no longer a problem. And there's certainly parts of the West right now in the United States are becoming overpopulated in relation to the water resources. And it's becoming very political. You're uh, talking about, for example, the Southwest with the concerns about what's the reservoir called? So I don't, I don't think that that's, that concern is over. And I am not worried about the species disappearing. And there may be some good things about certain places losing some population. All eyes are going to be on Japan because they're way out in front in terms of what happens to a society which just doesn't have very many children and little by little gets very old and then starts getting smaller and smaller. And same with and economic growth, interestingly. Them and Italy are two of the only examples I know of of developed democracies that have undergone two decades or more of almost stagnant economic growth. But if, if one is concerned about, oh, you know, if you look into the future, isn't it potentially dire that you go into a kind of slow death spiral? I do not think that there is a governmental answer to this. And it's, it's just, it doesn't have to do with policies. It has to do with what people want. And what people want really comes down to individuals and their decisions, their desires, I'm not saying that the larger culture doesn't have an influence. It certainly does. But in that sense, I think it's more important for me to talk to people who are maybe in couples and they're 30 years old and they're wondering whether they want any kids. And for my part, however ironically, and, you know, 
I take the accusation that I'm a total hypocrite cheerfully. But what I what I can do is to urge them to consider it. And that's for personal reasons, not for political reasons, but because they may be happier people. They may have a richer life. And that I believe bears out in the data. And in, and certainly I, I believe it bears out that the vast majority of people who do have kids are happy with the decision and don't regret it. So maybe yeah. as, as a final parting thought, is it so simple as folks like me who have kids and are happy about it need to be louder about that? Yeah. Talk more about what a joy it is rather than complaining. And it's always seductive to complain. And people now conceive of child rearing is an enormous amount of bother. So maybe we just need to express more satisfaction if we have had had, had children and talk about the fun bit and the satisfying bit. That used to be much more commonplace. We're living in a negative time. I'm sure this is one reason I fit in so well. I mean, um, certainly the mental health statistics bear that out. But before we get off of the happy note that we're on, <laughs> maybe... Yeah, let's just end on the on the on the happy note that we're on, and, and let me just say, uh, Lionel Striver, thank you so much for joining us in the Free Mind Podcast and for speaking recently at the Benson Center. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm grateful to the Benson Center for bringing me over. It was a nice night, and it was fun to uh, reprise our conversation. Yes, thanks again. The Free Mind Podcast is produced by the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado Boulder. You can email us feedback at freemind at colorado.edu or visit us online at colorado.edu slash center slash Benson. You can also find us on social media. Our Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube accounts are all at Benson Center. Our Instagram is at the Benson Center. And the Facebook is at Bruce D. Benson Center.